There's a lot of confusion out there around health. One minute we hear something's great for us, and next week we hear something's bad for us. And I don't think it needs to be as complicated as it sometimes might appear to be. So my hope today is that we can help people cut through the confusion. Sounds fantastic. Yeah? Yeah. Alcohol. <laughs> go. go. I, I thought we start with alcohol. <laughs> okay, is there any benefit for our health when we drink alcohol? No. Um, but as with everything, and I imagine most of the topics we'll talk about today, there are always caveats. So if you look at hard health outcomes, there's some mixed results and mixed research. And what previously we thought was that moderate alcohol consumption, so within, say, the alcohol guidelines, um, was associated with, with better health outcomes overall. So not drinking alcohol is less good for your health than, than drinking some. Um, when you then sort of break out the, diff the different health conditions, um, you might see that a small amount of alcohol intake or regular alcohol intake is associated with lower risk of cardiovascular disease, but then that's balanced by a slightly higher risk of certain cancers. So overall, if your main outcome is, say, how long do you live? There doesn't really seem to be any, any effect uh, of alcohol, uh, either either beneficial or, or, or negative, in terms of moderate consumption. If you try and then figure out, well, what's a, a safe amount to consume? Uh, there are several studies, and you know, me, I'm particularly interested in the brain. So there was a, a recent study that looked at brain volume, so the size of people's brains, which is which decreases over time. That's associated with risk of cognitive decline and dementia, and a drink once a week seemed to be just fine. But beyond that, you maybe start to see some, some detrimental effects. Are you saying there, Tommy, that our brain volume will decrease over time as we get older, but that more than one drink a week, potentially one alcoholic drink a week, increases that? So when you look at these kinds of data, they're generally not longitudinal, as in they don't look at the same person over time. What they do is they look at people across ages and across levels of drinking. And at one snapshot in time, they say, how much do you drink and what does your brain look like? Oh, so it's not the same person. It's not tracking. the same person. So we kind of, so we cannot say that um, alcohol is the driver here. Uh, when you do this kind of epidemiological research, we call it an association, right? This amount of alcohol is associated with these changes in the brain, but we don't know if it's truly causal. Mm -hmm. Um, we can adjust for a whole, but that's what we do with statistics. We adjust for other things that may be accounting for that. And then we, we think whatever's left is a signal. So, so I think that there are a few studies that basically suggest that drinking one or two drinks one or two times a week is probably fine. But anything above that, there's certainly no benefit. And then it may be detrimental to our brain health and our, our other health. The other side of that, though, is that... Um, Often people drink alcohol in social situations and that if it's helping to facilitate social connection and it means, you know, you're going down the pub with your mates and you get to spend time and, and, and talk with them, that probably offsets some of, the, some of those effects. So it's not always black and white, good or bad, um, but higher levels of drinking than that are, don't seem to be associated with improved health and maybe associated with worse, worse health. Um, but there, you know, drinking some amount is probably just fine. Uh, but then context and other things are going to be important as well. Yeah, I think you've bring up some really interesting points. And it's kind of one of the reasons I wanted to have this conversation with you is to try and bring that context and nuance that I think is often lost in the conversation around health these days, you know, everything's either good or bad, yeah. which diet is best, you know, is alcohol all good or all bad? It's like, well, hold on a minute. It kind of depends. And I agree that it's pretty hard to make a case that there's a physiological benefit to consuming alcohol. But I think we also have to acknowledge that many cultures have managed to drink small amounts of alcohol now and again in yeah, the community. Absolutely. And they seem to have high rates of longevity yeah. and minimal disease. So it's like everything is balanced, right? And you can look at the Blue Zones, for example, which are front and center of everyone's mind at the moment because of, you know, the Netflix show. And I know there can be some debates on various things in the Blue Zones, but I think one thing we can say is that many of these populations, they do 
drink alcohol. But they're also doing a lot of other things very well that may counterbalance that, like low stress, nutritious foods, strong sense of community, and all these things. So yeah, if we say though, what are the negatives? If we if we really try to address, okay, for someone who does drink, let's say more than that one drink a week mm-hmm. and goes, well, I feel okay, right? You know, I think I'm eating well, I'm moving my body well, um, you know, but you're saying more than one drink a week may be problematic. How would you have them think about that? You know, are there some key things, for example, you say, well, just watch out for these three things because this is what alcohol consumption can Mm -hmm. do if you're not careful. It's really difficult to tease that out at those very moderate levels, you know, within, say, government alcohol guidelines, right? Because it's going to be very subtle and you may not, there may not even be something that you can, you know, put your finger on and say, that's definitely something that you you need to watch out for. Um, When you talk about, the blue zones, they may, you know, some of them, they may drink red wine every day. But in general, portion sizes are much smaller than we would consider a, a mm. glass of wine, say, uh, in the UK. Um, so it's probably even more moderate than, than we might think. And of course, all the other things that you mentioned uh, come into play. So one one thing that I see very frequently is people really don't want to give up alcohol and 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 i i'm not here sitting saying that you should of course you know i i do i do drink uh occasionally and socially but you might think about you know what is it that alcohol is is facilitating for you like why has it become a habit if it is a mm-hmm. habit and so if it's the social social aspect then actually now it's much easier to get non-alcoholic cocktails non-alcoholic beers you can still go out and you can have that that same kind of ritual with your friends or, or with yourself that gives you that feeling of relaxation, even though there's no alcohol involved. So you can get all of those benefits. You can still feel like you're getting that de-stressing at the end of the day with like a beer in front of the TV or something like that. Um, all of that is still is still possible. Um, and so you can think about maybe re- replacing those things in um, occasionally. And then it's also worth thinking about often when people sort of fight against the idea that may, maybe they may be drinking too much. Often we, we hear about that it's like they're bargaining. Oh, but I do all these other things. So isn't it okay that I drink alcohol? And I'm not here to, to yeah. judge one way or the other, but it's just worth thinking about. Like, are you trying to find ways to justify it? Um, and if you are, then that maybe signifies that that's worth thinking about even deeper and, and, and maybe considering some alternatives. Yeah, I really like that approach. One thing I think about with my patients who are in this conundrum is I, I always talk to them about their sleep mm. because I think alcohol for many people disrupts their sleep and often they're not aware of it. Yeah. You know, if they get this sleep fragmentation, they're waking up multiple times in the night. They don't always know that. They just know they feel tired mm. the next day. And I found that some people don't always put that together yeah. with alcohol the night before. So I know with certain patients I've said, why don't we try a week without just see how you feel. And sometimes I go, wow, I've got so much energy and I'm sleeping better. And then that's empowerment because I'm very much like you, Tommy. I don't really want to tell people what to do with their lives. I don't think it's my place to. And I think alcohol now is becoming, again, a big thing that we're talking about in the public health arena for good reason, because many people do have a problematic relationship with alcohol. But I think we've got to be very careful. It doesn't go to nobody should be drinking ever. I personally don't really drink much anymore. I don't think I've had an alcohol that drink in maybe four or five years now. I have no ethical or moral problem with people who do <laughs> at all. It's just in my own life, I found I got to a point where I just don't need this anymore. Like yeah. it's not doing anything for me. And I prefer the way I feel without it. So yeah, I don't know. Anything else you want to add on alcohol perhaps? Yeah, from my own personal experience, I notice that it effect- negatively affects my sleep. That's one of the reasons why I don't drink very regularly, you know, maybe once a month or something, because I certainly feel less well rested the next day. It, it um, affects your temperature regulation. So you like like hot during the night or other things you just don't feel as as as, as rested. So that that's certainly uh, that's a nice in because I think that's something that, that people will will appreciate that that's going to be important and they'll notice the difference. And may I ask, given that you know it affects you negatively, because this is the funny thing about alcohol, mm. I think, we 
we all know, I know when I was drinking that you're going to not feel good the next yeah. day or you're not going to be your best self the next day, yet we still do it. Mm. So I guess it's a bit of a personal question, but <laughs> given that you know all that, and I kind of, I'm asking this just for the purpose of asking it rather than, you know, trying to highlight anything because, you know, we're all human. Mm. Given that you know it's going to negatively affect your next day, what goes through your mind before you actually consume it? So I've, historically, I, I've, I've struggled with a lot of these things around alcohol. I had what some people might have considered disordered eating a long time ago and being very hyper-focused about the quality of the food that I ate and, and, and what I ate. And so it's taken me a long time to work on some of those things. And in reality, I've gotten to a point where I'm, where if I've decided to do it, then I lean into enjoying it. So if I'm going to eat this cake, I'm going to enjoy this cake. Yeah. Like this is, you know, I'm all, and all the reasons why, why I'm eating it. Just like, if I'm going to have a nice cocktail, I'm going to make sure it's a, it's a nice cocktail. I'm really going to enjoy it. I'm with yeah. my friends. I'm having a nice dinner. So I really lean into um, the enjoyment factor because the, the alternative is spending hours then worrying about the thing that I ate or the thing that I drank and how that's going to affect my health. And that worrying is probably worse than the yeah. eating and drinking itself. So I embrace the the positive sides of it because, you know, it's usually a social aspect or, yeah. or some other thing. And then uh, and I think that's, that's how I approach it. Yeah. Love it, Tommy. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. Let's move on to caffeine. Uh -huh. Okay. There's plenty more I could do on alcohol, <laughs> but I think I'm going to try and discipline myself to keep moving through topics today. Caffeine. Good or bad for our health? Uh, yes. <laughs> um, as as ever, and I think this is going to happen several times. The, the answer is uh, it depends. Um, there's certainly if we go back to the uh, epidemiological observational evidence where you ask people how much coffee they drink and then you look at their health outcomes, it seems like drinking up to you know three or four, maybe more small cups of coffee. So, so probably like one or two of my cups of coffee, um, per day is associated with, um, improved health outcomes and that's, uh, liver disease, Alzheimer's disease. Um, and then, um, there's certainly no, no signal of harm, right? So it, it doesn't seem to be harmful up, up to those levels and, and, and maybe some benefit. Of course, there's no randomized controlled trials of coffee drinking that, that show that definitively. Um, but there does seem to be some potential benefit there. And there's, there's a lots of um, polyphenols and other things in, in say, coffee, for instance, or, uh, or tea. Um, Could you just explain what a polyphenol yeah, is for someone who doesn't know? Yeah, so these are the compounds. Often they're colourful that make up these beans or berries, and it's the same. They're in the same class of compounds that make, like, blueberries blue. But they have, um, you know, coffee has its own um, compounds like that that seem to affect our gut microbiome. Uh, they affect our vascular health. And there are randomized controlled trials actually on some of that. They extract those polyphenols out and they mm. give them to people and look at their cardiovascular function or their, you know, their, uh, the health of their blood vessels mm. or their cognitive function. And they seem to be beneficial. So um, those are the kinds of things that are coming along for the ride uh, with caffeine. But sometimes uh, when you look at the research, like decaf coffee, for instance, doesn't has some of the benefits, but maybe not all of the benefits of of uh, caffeinated coffee. But again, you have to think about, well, what kind of person drinks decaf versus regular coffee? And it's probably the differences in those people that's driving that rather than the caffeine itself. So I think there's definitely a signal that some caffeinated beverages uh, you know, may be associated with improved health outcomes. And that's probably because some of the compounds that come along for the ride in those, both tea and coffee separately. But then you have to think about the other side. So what are the things that caffeine can potentially negatively affect? The most obvious one is, is sleep. And different people have different uh, abilities to metabolize caffeine. So there's a gene uh, that, that affects how fast you metabolize caffeine. And anybody who's done a genetic test will have probably gotten that on there yeah. and know if they're a fast or slow metabolizer. And there's some early evidence that suggests that people who are slow metabolizers that drink a bunch of caffeine may be getting some negative uh, effects of that just because it's hanging around in their system for, for much longer. Um, but you probably know that a little bit about yourself anyway, or a lot of people do. So I, you know, I know some people who are very sensitive to caffeine, right? They have any at all and they're awake for 24 hours. Mm. They can't sleep. Whereas um, others, and then Again, it becomes, you know, you don't know what's habit versus real, but some people who say, you know, I can drink caffeine late at night and it doesn't affect my sleep at all. 
We don't really know if that's necessarily true, but it's certainly there's there's some good evidence from uh, randomized controlled trials. There was a meta-analysis that came out um, in the last year or two that, that looked at caffeine intake and it can affect sleep architecture and how much sleep you're getting. Negatively. Negatively, yes. So then it's just a case of making sure that you're timing your caffeine relative to your sleep so that it doesn't negatively affect your sleep. Um, so for me, I try not to drink caffeine after midday because there was this period of time where... I was having coffee, you know, every night and, you know, we we're in the lab or, and everybody's drinking coffee in the late afternoon. This is very, I did my, did my PhD in, uh, in Norway and it's very normal to have a cup of coffee at four o'clock in the afternoon or something. I couldn't figure out why I couldn't sleep. Um, and then that it sort of tinkering with caffeine timing, that, 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 that made a really big difference, but that's going to be very personal from, from person to person, like how much, how much it affects them. The other thing that I think is very interesting about caffeine is how it affects cognitive function. And if you're doing very simple tasks or you're very sleep deprived, caffeine does seem to be beneficial. But if you consume a lot of caffeine, it can actually negatively affect your cognitive function, particularly on complex tasks. So it might improve your action time. But if you had to think through some complex task, and they, they do this in the lab with like complex executive function, like how, how, how fast mm. can you interpret this diagram or how fast can you uh, like reel off these different things? Having a bunch of caffeine in your system can actually make you perform worse. And it's interesting because people think they're performing better, but they're actually performing worse. So caffeine like improves your mood, which we know it does, but it doesn't necessarily improve your performance. Yeah, it's so interesting. There's quite a few things to pick up on there. First of all, genetic testing. I like the theory behind the genetic testing of fast metabolizers and slow metabolizers. But what I've seen with certain people and experienced myself, I think I am a fast metabolizer genetically, uh -huh. but I'm exquisitely sensitive. Yeah. Right? So I'm like, wait a minute, the genes are saying this, but I can be, I've got to be very careful with my caffeine intake, both in terms of dose and timing. For many years, I won't touch caffeine after 12 o'clock midday. Mm -hmm. Unless there's some, you know, I'm, I'm tired and I'm, I'm driving, right? Yeah. Or I really need to get through, knowing there may be a consequence that evening as well. But uh, for, for whatever reason, I need to get through something. So that was the first thing to comment on. So, And I'll just quickly respond to that by saying that whenever you think about any part of a biological system, it's not just one thing yeah, that's exactly. important, right? So... Um, your caffeine metabolism will tell you how far, like, or should tell you on average how fast you'll clear it. But caffeine attaches to a receptor. It's an, it's a, it's an adenosine receptor antagonist. So there's going to be polymorphisms in the receptors. There's going to be differences in, in how you then respond to that, to caffeine binding to that receptor and what happens in the cell. And that's going to be different from person to person as well. So yeah, you're right. Just that one thing isn't going to be enough to tell you exactly how you're going to respond to caffeine. Yeah, and I think also something I'm quite passionate about, whether it be alcohol or caffeine, is that I've noticed with patients and myself that the kind of stress load in your life also can play a role here. Mm. For example, I remember when I did used to drink, not to excess, but if I'd have a glass of red wine or a beer in midweek, let's say after work, mm. sometimes I wouldn't sleep so well. And you'd feel it the next day, you know, maybe one or two units of alcohol but the same amount when I was on holiday, I wouldn't feel a thing. Yeah. Now it could be, you know, different alcohol, but you know, it was kind of similar. And I really thought about this. I thought, well, my stress load is right down. I feel I've got a lot of headroom psychologically and mentally as well. And I think, you know, I really think about this idea that I don't think we can completely separate biology and psychology. Like, I do feel there's something about that. So if you're really, really stressed and you're using caffeine to get you through, I don't know. I, I, I really sort of believe there'll be a different impact than yeah. if you're very relaxed and drinking it. Yeah, and caffeine partly activates the sympathetic nervous system, which, you know, the stress, fight or flight side of your nervous system. So if you're adding, if you're pouring that on top of a whole bunch of other psychological stress, of course, there's the potential for a greater negative effects like the context is, is important as well absolutely did you ever see the study uh i think it was in 2011 from the university of bristol where they looked at caffeine drinkers and they tried to really answer the question from recollection 
does caffeine really enhance performance mm. and enhance our cognition? And the conclusion of that study was if you are a habitual caffeine drinker, then yes, consuming your caffeine in the morning does raise your mood and cognition, but only to the level of where non-caffeinated yeah. drinkers are all the time. And I find that really interesting because it kind of makes sense to me that for a lot of us that would be the case that if we, because in the past I have quit and I haven't had it for a few months and I'm like, I feel great all the time. <laughs> Even I don't need a morning cup of tea or coffee, but I do enjoy it. So what is your perspective on that? And then how does that fit alongside the fact that athletes, for example, or I know you work in Formula One, for example, so I don't know if you encourage your drivers to maybe have caffeine or not. So that's a, a very well cited study, the one that you mentioned. I think that's probably right, is that a lot of that first caffeine boost is just making up the the caffeine deficiency that you've you've generated because you're so habituated to it and that takes you up to sort of like your normal baseline. Um and then you can you can wean yourself off within a couple of weeks and that that effect goes away. Um the I think the the Formula One drivers it's very different from from driver to driver, but something that I've noticed over the years actually fits very well with what I was saying earlier. So there are multiple components to performing well in that environment. But if you think about uh, the beginning of a Formula One race, there are two things you want to do. You want to get off the line as fast as you can, mm. and you want to navigate the first corner while 19 other cars are trying to do the same thing. So caffeine, and this is based on the work of Yerkes and Dodson, uh, which looks at how um, at your arousal level and your performance of of tasks, and there's this there's this classic arousal curve, which is base which basically says that the more aroused you are, the better you perform up to a point where greater arousal is basically more anxiety and more stress, and then your performance goes down. And every sport has its own sweet spot mm. for arousal. So, if you're a sprinter in the blocks, your your optimal arousal level is very different from a snooker player. Right or a, or an archer, mm -hmm. even in the even in the Olympics, right? The, so that's why um, they banned beta blockers, which sort of calm down your nervous system in those sports where you want to be like very calm, like like archery, say, or or some kind of shooting or snooker. Um, I think whereas, used to in the eighties, I think yeah. even they drink whilst playing snooker yeah, I think because so. it would calm them down exactly. exactly. Yeah, um, for that reason, so they're adjusting their arousal curve, um, but. Something like caffeine will Im improve your performance um, in a simple cognitive task or a simple task. So particularly what the thing that they measure, measure is reaction time. It's often called a psychomotor vigilance task. So if you want to get, get off the line fast in a Formula One car, caffeine is great. Mm. Um, but what happens is that you can get to a point where your caffeine dose is so high it will then affect your ability to navigate the first corner because all of us, which is a much more complex cognitive task because you're trying to figure out the direction you're going plus where all the other cars are. Um, and so you can, you can caffeinate, you want to caffeinate yourself to the point and not all drivers use caffeine. This is the, like some find some benefit from small doses at the right time. But you want to improve your reaction time off the line, but you don't want to negatively affect your ability to then navigate the first few corners of the race. So there's a really fine line in terms of that arousal curve. And I've seen that in action in Formula One drivers, so I just think it's really interesting. Yeah, absolutely fascinating. Even that idea that different sports have got different times where you want to peak. Yeah. And I guess then taking it back to a non-sportsman, well, we've all got different things in our lives that are important to us. And different times in the day when we want to peak, right? Yeah. So, you know, again, what's the right dose for you? What's the right time for it? Which I guess comes with experimentation yeah. and just trying to bring alcohol and caffeine together and sort of close them off. I guess what you're saying, and I would agree with Tommy, is that there's pros and cons <laughs> and we need to figure out what works for us. And if, for example, you really enjoy your caffeine, and it has no seemingly negative effects on your mood, your anxiety levels, or your sleep. And even if you accept that drinking it might just bring you back up to the level that if you didn't drink it, but you get so much enjoyment out of it, you know, I love a good cup of black coffee in the uh -huh. morning for sure, then it's probably worth it. Yeah. 
But if you enjoy it and love it, and it's giving you palpitations and anxiety, and it's trashing your sleep, and you're moody and reactive with the people around you, you know, you might want to rethink about your relationship with it, basically. <laughs> so it's not black or white. When you sort of bring them together, I think, if you think about uh, our collective modern lifestyles, that's a phrase that you use. Um, what, what often happens is that you'll drink at the end of the day, then you'll need to, you won't sleep very well. You'll have to drink coffee all day because you're sleep deprived. And then to wind down, you're going to need alcohol at the end of the night. So they, they often reinforce one another. And so again, it's just worth thinking about how is it uh, affecting you? Is, is there, is it possible that there's this, they're sort of perpetuating, perpetuating a cycle of one another that you can somehow try it, try and break. And if it's not ne negatively affecting you, you're still performing well, you feel good great you know we neither of us would recommend that you change anything but it's, it's possible that they they can go hand in hand in that way as well yeah and the, the whole point of this conversation tommy and i think for me you're the perfect person to have this conversation with is there's too much of in my view at least is it good or bad yeah you know you can't really answer that question and hopefully certainly for alcohol and caffeine hopefully we've given people a few things to think about yeah. what about sugar Again, sugar is something that people say, well, is it good or bad? And I know it depends. And we're going to hear that a lot today. But why don't you tackle sugar? Where, where do we go wrong with sugar? You know, is sugar intrinsically problematic for us? Or is it more the volumes that we're consuming? Of course, I, I think it's the I think it's the latter. It's both the, the quantity and the context of it. And there's been a lot of interest in terms of um, so basic sugar sucrose, which is 50-50 glucose and fructose. It's a disaccharide. It just means two sugars bound together. And fructose has really come under the microscope recently because it can affect our uric acid levels, which is mm. often used as a, as a risk factor for gout, but it's often used as like a sort of marker of our metabolic health. And fructose can affect cellular energy levels if it's, you know, in the way that it's metabolized and it can be quite intensive on the cell, particularly in the liver. What, what does that mean? Cellular energy levels? Yeah. So inside the cell, we have this energy currency called ATP. And uh, in order to metabolize fructose, we end up using all of that within the cell. And you can get to this point where it's almost a stressor on the cell in order to metabolize mm. it. And that's maybe one of the reasons why uh, fructose is an issue for some people and it's certainly you know, high amounts of fructose consumption and or sugar, which is 50% fructose, can increase the risk of things like fatty liver, um, fatty liver disease, which is increasingly common. Although the other side of that is that there are potentially other nutritional deficiencies that are affecting the ri your risk of that um, uh, as well, uh, particularly choline, uh, which uh, is important for, for packaging uh, fat uh, out of the liver. And if you don't have enough of that, then the liver, the liver can accumulate fat with, with high amounts of, of sugar. But in reality, when I think about individual food components, and there were several other things that we could talk about that are controversial in addition to sugar, but it's really the context of the sugar that we're currently consuming. And like you said, the quantities of it. I like to think that the majority of our diet should be minimally processed and nutrient dense foods so they you know support the function of our bodies and other than just being a source of energy there's nothing else in sugar that's that's really beneficial so if you're consuming a large proportion of your calories from sugar you're not consuming foods that have nutrients in that are then important for doing everything else mm. and it's that's really the same with all ultra processed foods or um, highly processed um, packaged foods. They're generally nutrient poor, calorie dense. They negatively affect our ability to understand our hunger and satiety signals. And we know that we overconsume them because they're hyper palatable. We eat much more of them than we would have something else that's less processed. And people get into the issue of what processing actually is or what processing means. And so like the definition of ultra processed foods basically means that it's highly refined and they've usually added additives, fillers, and things like that in order to keep it shelf stable. So you can just like stick it in a packet and it can stay there for, for months or, or years on end. Years on end. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I don't particularly ever focus on sugar individually uh, because it would be very easy to remove sugar, but you just replace it with some other highly processed food that 
um, is is you know is is going to have the same effects because it's out competing more more nutritious foods. Um, so in general, I would think about the entire dietary pattern because there's there's no evidence that some sugar is detrimental to our health, really. But what do you mean by that? Because that, some people are going to go, what do you mean? Oh, wait a minute, I, I thought sugar was bad for me. Yeah. So when you say there's no evidence that some sugar is detrimental, would you just expand on that a little bit, Tommy? Yeah, so um, in general, if you are eating within your caloric requirements and you're otherwise healthy, then consuming some sugar doesn't really seem to have a negative effect, right? It's a source of energy, Um there's no real reason to assume that, you know, a large part of our metabolism runs on glucose. Um, when we metabolize fructose, which is the other half of sugar, it gets turned into glucose. It gets used as an energy source. So if you're in otherwise good health and you're eating, you know, consuming enough of the nutrients in general from your diet, there's no reason why sugar should be detrimental. It's when it then becomes a, the major source of energy and you're not getting all these other things that we might need from our diets information is not enough to make change in your life you have to take action so to help you take action after watching this video i've created a free nutrition guide for you this contains the five most important practices i've seen in over two decades of seeing patients they work for you no matter what your dietary preference there's a step-by-step -step action plan to help you implement those changes in your life if you want to receive that free guide right now just click on the link in the description box below so when usually when people cut out sugar, what they've done is they've dramatically improved the quality of their diet because they're eating other things now. Um, so I'm not I'm not uh, exonerating sugar in itself, but I think that focusing purely on that doesn't really tell us the, the greater story of what's the overall quality of your diet and what what's the overall sort of balance of nutrients you're taking in and fiber and and and, and other things. And I think, again, it's that point of context and what else is going on in your life mm. kind of influences whether sugar's a problem for you yeah. or not. And it's interesting, you know, Mark Sisson, the, would you call him a paleo guy or, you he's know, pri primal, primal, primal yeah. yes. And Mark, for people who don't know Mark, I think he's just gone 70 years old. Yeah. He's, he's in, in fantastic shape. Fantastic shape. Yeah. Eats a very primal, ancestral way of eating yeah. for a number of years. He's been talking about it, promoting it. But if he ever tweets about the fact that he will, I think he enjoys sugar in his coffee each morning, like uh -huh. one spoon of sugar. Oh my God, people go nuts <laughs> on it. And I would imagine that that really speaks to exactly what you're saying, that 90% of his diet is really good. Yeah, Whole foods, nutrient dense. He's fit and active. He moves his body every day. He looks after himself. In that context, one small spoon of sugar and a coffee each day is probably not a issue, right? Yeah. In that context, yeah, absolutely. someone else who, let's say, has a highly processed food diet, eating to excess, not because they're, they're lazy or gluttonous, because they struggle. They, mm. We all struggle, right? In that context, they may find that sugar or the amount of sugar in their diet is problematic. Is that is that another way we can look at this? Yeah, I, I think so. And and some of it can also be, you know, there's there's a big debate in the scientific world as to whether sugar is addictive or not. And you'll have people who have some uh, some evidence on both sides. And so that's like most things these right, days. Right, like most things. And I would say that I'm I'm not really sure. I like can in, in some people who consistently overeat, they do you know, get a large activation of reward centers in the brain when they eat sweet things. Whether that's the same as addiction is very difficult to really pass out. Although some people certainly have very problematic eating behaviors and that's its own psychological disorder that requires specialist inter intervention. But you're right that when we think about how um, we respond to certain foods, uh, Part of, part of the problem and, and with with the processing is that, and so when you're taking ref refined sugar, um, you've extracted it from sugar cane or sugar beets. You've you've taken it, or you know, we're as as a species, we very regularly have consumed sugar either from honey or from fruit, right? And nobody would tell you that eating an apple is going to be 
bad for you, even though, you know, there's a, a few grams of sugar in there. Well, some people would these days, actually, well, but, I, but well, that, generally. That I, that I think we can say is, <laughs> I'm confident saying that's not correct. Um, but when you uh, process foods with industrial modern methods, you divest the calories from their context. And so... Divest is a big word. Sorry, what's, you, what's you another like, word for you, that? You separate, you separate them out, yeah. right? They're... So when, so say we're historically, evolutionarily, if you did eat some fruit, you eat some sugar and that co it comes in this context yeah. of water and fiber and all these other things. And there's, the body expects some context for that sugar um, in terms of, and then how it affects your physiology and your hunger signals and stuff like that afterwards. When we process those foods and strip them out, the response that you get physiologically is no longer the same from the same amount of of that food so they've done this with um various grains right if you take a a whole grain you 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 could cook and eat uh, a handful of pearl barley say you know it's minimally processed that's how it looked on on the stem mm. it's still got all the fiber all the context um and then you look at how that affects your blood sugar um it, pro it probably has a quite a small effect on your blood sugar if you then take that same thing and you cook it and you grind it um, or you grind it and you cook it and you turn it into a paste or you turn it into bread, it has a much bigger effect on your blood sugar. It's exactly the same thing. Mm. But what you've done is you've changed the context of the food and then that affects how your body responds to it. So you're no longer getting macronutrients um, like things like carbs and fats or protein in the context that our bodies are used to getting them. Mm -hmm. And so that's where it starts to become problematic. So when when you create processed foods, you might add sugar to something that doesn't normally have sugar in it. Mm. And then that makes you want to eat more of it because you've you've started to create, and that's the idea of creating hyperpalatable hyper foods. Yeah. So even savory foods have some sugar in because you start to activate different receptors. You start to then drive a greater likelihood of, of overeating them. So that's where it starts to become problematic. So let's say the population we were looking at was all healthy. Everyone was of a, you know, a healthy weight, in inverted commas. They were metabolically healthy. Mm. Then in that context, of course, which isn't the context we're living in today, certainly not in most countries around yeah. the world these days. If that was the situation, then sugar here or there in our tea or coffee or whatever, you know, a sweet treat if you want. And I'm not convinced I love the word treat, but we, I think people know what, what we mean when we say that, you know, maybe once a week or once a fortnight or whatever, you know, or, or whatever you choose to do may be okay. Yeah. How does that though sit in the context of what we have today? So we know in the US, for example, what is it now? Is it 90% of US adults may have some degree of metabolic dysfunction? And actually the UK and Europe and most of the world are catching up. So we can't, we can't even single out the US anymore. So if we're saying the bulk of the adult population, and it's not just adults, I know, but the bulk of the population, unfortunately these days have a degree of metabolic dysfunction. So the way they're processing energy in the body is not as efficient as it could be. And that's leading to an increased risk of all kinds of diseases. In that context, is sugar now becoming even more problematic? It's absolutely contributing due to the way that we're due to the way that we're using it. The but again, I think it comes down to the entire context of the diet. Because you could certainly get to a point where, say we dramatically reduce sugar in foods, if that then comes with like a parallel decrease in overall caloric intake, say, there will absolutely be, be benefit. But when other people are in charge of creating these foods, you know, these ultra processed foods, those sugar calories are just going to be replaced by something else. And you're going to, mm. you're, you're going to overeat it just as much. And it's not really going to, going to change anything. So I, I think that if by reducing your sugar intake, you decrease your overall caloric intake and you improve your, um, the overall quality of your diet, that's absolutely going to be beneficial. But if that doesn't happen, and this this often happens with the way that we engineer foods nowadays, is just it'll be replaced by something else. Mm. And it and it and it may not make the same difference. So I, I think it really depends on how that gets enacted. If people so if you say that 
I want to reduce my, you know, I'm going to focus on sugar and you focus on reducing sugar intake. And then with that comes, you know, you're not eating cakes or biscuits. And with that, you've dramatically both decreased your, you know, overall energy intake and improved your diet quality. That's going to come with, with health benefits. But it's, if you then say, well, I'm not going to have cake, but I'm going to have, you know, an extra serving of fries instead, right? There's no sugar in that, but I'm not convinced you, you're not going to yeah. get any healthier. So it really depends yeah. on how those changes then, what the knock-on effect is. When, when we think about sugar, do we need to think beyond just actual table sugar that we might put in stuff or might be added to biscuits and cakes and pastries? Do we also need to be thinking, in your view, about blood sugar spikes? So, for example, one teaspoon of sugar in, in let's say, a hot drink that probably is not going to have as detrimental an impact or as significant an impact, I should say, on our blood sugar than, let's say, a modern uh, healthy cereal or a cereal that's marketed as healthy. When we know that you have a bowl of those, you can have the equivalent of far more than just one spoon of sugar in. Yeah. So I think sometimes when we think of sugar, we're not really... And maybe it's the way we communicate as healthcare professionals. Sometimes it's not just sugar, is it? It's also foods that are turned to sugar yeah. in your blood. So any or well, the vast majority of carbohydrates will get converted to either R or get converted into glucose, which then will at least temporarily increase your blood sugar uh, in response. And I think in general, that can be normal, right? We don't want to pathologize. That's another fancy word. We don't want to like create a disease out of spikes in blood sugar necessarily. Of course, there's lots of evidence that suggests that having better control of your blood sugar is associated with better mm -hmm. health outcomes. Um, particularly as you, you know, if people go into say pre-diabetes or type 2 diabetes, um, that's associated with a whole host of long-term chronic health conditions and um, earlier mortality. Um, so if you can have better blood sugar control, that's just, that's in general is associated with better health. And it, it, particularly in those populations, if you're somebody who's otherwise very healthy and very active and you once in a while eat something that causes a big, big spike in your blood sugar, I'm not convinced that's going to have a big impact, mm. right? It's all about the context like you talked about earlier. But you're right that anything that we eat that has carbohydrates in will will increase your blood sugar um, to, to, to some degree. And there are there's some evidence to suggest that if you can make that spike lower, and you can do that either by the timing of your foods. I, I know you've had episodes on this previously, uh, maybe eating protein with your foods. There are other things that you can do to decrease the, the size of that blood sugar spike. Uh, and for some people, that 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 may be beneficial. The, the problem is that it's really difficult to predict what foods will do that. Mm -hmm. um, 10 years ago, you would have talked about the glycemic index, right? So this is a food, it has a high glycemic index. That means when you eat it, you're going to get a big, big spike mm -hmm. in blood sugar. What we've learned in the last five years is that that just doesn't hold from person to person, yeah. right? You can have two people eat the identical foods and one person will get a big blood sugar spike and the other person won't get any spike at all. And... Then there was there's a recent study. It came out. It's um it's a preprint, so it's not formally published yet. It will come out as soon as uh, by by Kevin Hall, who's done all these very mm. complex metabolic ward studies in the U.S. And they they had these trials where um, they gave people a fixed uh, a fixed menu, and they had a plant based one, they had a, a low fat one, uh, a low carb one, um, and the menu would cycle over a couple of weeks. So they would have, and then some of these, uh, some of the people in these trials wore continuous glucose monitors. And then because the menu rotated, they would get a, a blood sugar response to the same meal in the same person, but a week or two apart. And what they found was that eating the same meal in the same person resulted in completely different blood sugar responses from one week to the next, which just tells us that we don't, we, we have, mm. like right now, we cannot predict what foods will uh, spike our blood sugar. So even if we we have our own, I see you're wearing a continuous gl mm. uh, a glucose monitor, um, that you, you can, you have to test something out a lot yeah. again and again in yourself to, to see an effect. And even then there's going to be a lot of variability. So 
then is that even meaningful or feasible for for some people? It becomes it becomes really difficult. Um, so I think like managing blood sugar is obviously incredibly important, but right now it's just really tricky to navigate. And there's uh, you know Tim Spector's done some recent studies uh, where they show that a whole bunch of things affect how you respond. So it's how did you sleep? What meal of the day is it? Like, what's your genetics? Like, have you exercised recently? There's a whole bunch of things that affect how we respond to foods. And and even in the same person, the same meal has has different effects yeah. from one week to the next. So, But um, I think that speaks to what you said, maybe when we were talking about alcohol or caffeine, that in a biological system, it's very rarely just one thing, yeah. right? It's because you're assuming that everything else in that system is identical when it isn't. And yeah. we're not the same person day to day. We, you know, for anyone who has worn a continuous sugar monitor, and I think for some people that can be tricky to figure out, well, what does this actually mean for me? I feel I'm quite in tune with my body and I, I guess it's what I do. And I think about this and sort of pay attention a lot. And I, I certainly found for me that you can see correlations quite well where, you know, depending on if you haven't slept well, yeah, you, your sugar's higher and you, the same meal can give you a bigger response. Or if I feel high levels of stress, I guess with everything we're talking about, we've done alcohol, caffeine, sugar, but on ultra processed food so far as well. Are we not more and more moving into an N equals one era whereby we can use science to give us good starting points and ideas, but ultimately we're going to have to test these things out on ourselves and go, well, is this working for me? I think so. And that's, you know, even going back, say, 50 years, um, this is in a slightly different arena, but looking at um, elimination diets were once the the gold standard for people with autoimmune certain autoimmune conditions before we we uh, invented monoclonal antibodies for for these things and the only way to know if they worked was to you know change your diet and see how the patient responded and you would do that individually and mm. i think that's that's where we we really are at this point that the the problem is that so say um if we go back to back to blood sugar or we stay on blood sugar I'm not convinced that the data is necessarily helpful for people. So say I, I don't generally recommend that people go out and get a, a mm -hmm. blood sugar monitor. Um, and one of the reasons is that it becomes, and, and I've seen this several times when working with people, it becomes incredibly stressful. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to eat a piece of cake. I know that cake is going to spike my blood sugar. I'm now stressed about mm -hmm. the blood sugar spike that I'm going to see because of the cake that I'm that I'm eating, um, and you know we've had people who've who've come back and just we didn't really appreciate how much stress, like the, the idea of eating mm. and how that was going to affect the the data that they see was incredibly stressful to them. So, like, is that you know, at what point does does that become harmful? And and there are there are actually studies that show that the expectation of a blood sugar spike drives a bigger blood sugar spike. So mm. there was a study by Ellen Langer at Harvard where they took diabetics and they gave them a milkshake and they showed them how much sugar was in this milkshake. There was a high sugar milkshake mm. and they saw a big blood sugar spike. And then later on, they came back and they gave them a different milkshake. It was a low sugar milkshake and they showed them that and they had a lower blood sugar spike. It was the same milkshake both times, but they had a bigger blood sugar spike when they thought that it had more sugar in it. Biology and psychology. Yeah, biology and psychology <laughs> coming together. So it just... I think that, yes, the N equals one experiment is really important, but I think that rather than like being hyper-focused on this one thing, which is blood sugar, can you move yourself closer to a less processed diet, right? Increase vegetable uh, consumption, right? So make vegetables a bigger part of your plate mm. or start with a bigger uh, portion of protein, on your on your plate, right? That's going to come with both. Those going to come with a whole bunch of nutrients and these other things, um, and then maybe decrease the portion of whatever it is, whatever yeah. is it, refined carbohydrates or something. So I think that overall shifting your dietary pattern is much more important, and that doesn't need necessarily unless there are different foods that you enjoy as much. N equals one experimentation. So I think we're 
at a point where you can, particularly with, with diet, you can give pretty good advice that's going to work for a lot of people and they don't need fancy tools and they mm. don't need fancy data and they can still make a big impact on their health. Yeah. I appreciate your perspective on that. And I've always had a real caution with trackers. I guess the argument you're making around CGMs, continuous glucose monitors, I guess we could also make about, let's say, scales, for example, mm. and weights. And I kind of feel a lot of this becomes personality dependent, whereby for some people, scales and their weight becomes incredibly obsessive and yeah. becomes problematic. And then for others, it's like, yeah, they can check once a week and oh, yeah, I'm going in the right direction. I've mentioned, I think before with you that I saw the same thing with blood pressure monitors, which aren't like modern tech necessarily, but God, for half the patients, it was great. For the other half, it was anxiety inducing. Yeah. I guess where I see CGMs as being different is I kind of feel that they give a real, I, and I totally agree they can be overdone. I think if you've got a history of eating disorders, you've got to be very cautious, probably not the right approach for you. But in the context of a population, as we say, maybe 60, 70% in the UK, maybe 90% in the US of the population having a degree of metabolic dysfunction, I think in that context... I personally believe we have to be open to tools that are going to help people because we've been asking people to make these choices for years. And I feel that we're still struggling. And a lot of that's because of our food environment, I know. But I don't think I've seen a better tool, Tommy, in over two decades of practice now where I, I don't think I've seen a better tool that helps people start to change their diet in a meaningful way than a CGM. I don't think everyone needs them. But I would say from my own experience with people and also myself, I found them to also to be very, very helpful. So that would be what I would say in response. So I think we have maybe a slightly different perspective on this, which is okay as well. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And, and there are studies in type 2 diabetics that, and again, early small studies suggesting that having a CGM improves their adherence to, um, say, a dietary intervention or dietary recommendation. So, so absolutely, sometimes that can, you know, give people some accountability and help drive some behavior change. Um, and it's with, like, the, let's say a step count on your watch or your uh, phone. For some people, it works great. And it motivates them. Like, oh, I didn't get my 7,000 today. 7,000 is my target. So I'm going to go, for, I'm only at 5,000. After dinner, I'm going to go for a walk around the block. But for other people, it becomes an obsession and problematic. So I think, again, you know, relaying this to alcohol and caffeine and sugar, I'd say kind of, I think it depends a lot. And I do think we can overdo these things. And I, I do, you know, as I, I think I mentioned last time, I, I did wear an aura ring a few years ago, but I haven't worn one in years now because I kind of learned what I needed. Yeah. I, I kind of, oh, I get it. If I eat near bedtime, seat quality goes down. Okay, great. If... I saw a few other things and I, I don't really feel I need it anymore. I learned what I did. And I kind of feel for some people, like you wear a CGM once for two weeks and you have your regular foods and you're like, I had no idea that that does that to me. I had no idea. I think for some of you, that's all they ever need. Yeah. You know? So yeah, this, this will be continued, I'm sure, as we see this evolve over the coming years. Protein. I think there's a lot of confusion about protein and there's a lot of talk in the longevity space about the optimal amount of protein that you need uh, for your muscle mass, um, which is important for longevity. And I don't disagree that muscle mass is important for longevity. There's also advocates for low protein diets. And I think this is a, one of those areas where there's a lot of debate about, and I think it leaves people feeling confused. So how do you view protein and what kind of recommendations do you make to the people that you see? We'll be back to the conversation in just a moment. Now, many of us struggle to find time to eat all of these incredible whole foods. That's why I'm a big fan of good quality whole food supplements like this one that's been in my own life for over three years now. It contains over 75 whole food source ingredients, vitamins, minerals, pre and probiotics, and can help us support our energy, focus, digestion, and our immune system. 
AG1 are giving my audience a fantastic offer, one year supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first order. You can see all details at drinkag1.com forward slash live more or just click on the link below. And now back to the conversation. I generally think that people under eat protein um, at the population level. And part of that is driven by the types of foods that they eat, which tend to be low protein. Um, Could you just explain population level? In yeah, case so we don't get it. Yeah, so if you if you were gonna if you're gonna look at how people eat in the US or the UK on average, um, so that's the population level. Uh, how much protein are they eating? And I, in general, I think people eat too little, particularly as they get older. When you look at some of the evidence around protein intake and longevity there's two broad streams of evidence one is animal data a lot of it's from mice and i I mentioned this last time i was on the podcast i do animal research for a living that's what pays the bills and most animal research is not useful for humans at all i think most of it's a complete waste of time um and i would include most dietary studies in rodents, if I'm honest, because rodents are not small humans. And we have seen again and again how um, these kinds of studies fail to translate to humans. So if you feed a mouse, which doesn't normally eat a high protein diet, a high protein diet, you may see some negative effects on their health. That doesn't necessarily, that tells you that you shouldn't feed mice a bunch of protein. It doesn't tell you (laughs) whether you should feed humans more protein. And humans evolutionarily consumed a lot more protein. Like in addition to being gatherers, we were hunters and it made up like animal protein made up a large proportion of our diet. And our, we are, our digestive system and our metabolism is in tune with that. And, you know, that I think that that's an important consideration. Like what are we, what are we looking at to try and tell us some of this? The other type of information more studies that we get are usually epidemiological studies. So we ask people how they eat, and then we look at how long they live or what diseases they get later on. There are two problems with that. One is that people are really bad at telling us how they eat. Um, so uh, there's one classic study on protein and cancer and longevity that came out in cell metabolism um, um, nearly 10 years ago. And they talked about how you know low protein was beneficial early in life and then higher protein was beneficial later in life. Um, and they used, uh, so there was some mouse data and then there was some, some human data and they used a, a study called NHANES, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey in the US, mm-hmm. where they call, they call up a few thousand people every year and they say, what did you eat in the last 24 hours? And then they say, um, you know, so you, so you tell them and then they're like, are you sure you didn't have any ice cream? Are you sure you didn't have a beer, right? So like things that people just tend to underreport, And then that's it. That is then assumed to be their diet every day. And well, they also ask them how typical it was, right, um, for their diet. And then they look at how long they live 20 years later. And there have been some studies on NHANES data in particular. Um, there, was, there was a nice paper that came out that said that the majority of dietary responses in NHANES were not physiologically plausible. As in, these people, based on how tall they are, how much Mm. they weigh, their physical activity levels, what they've told us they eat cannot physically be correct. It is physiologically implausible that they're eating this amount. And we're using that, we're using the protein intake from that study to say, this is how, you know, know, this is how protein affects your health. In reality, we have no idea what these people are eating. So, the, a lot of the data that comes from, um, the, that is being used to make recommendations, particularly to eat low protein, is just so highly flawed that I just wouldn't even look at it. I, I, it's mm. not even worth is not even worth considering. So then, you might think about what about some interventional data, right? We have um, people, and we change the amount of protein that they eat, and then we we look at some outcomes. Can you just explain interventional data yeah. as well? So in, interventional means that. There's some people who come in for a study and we physically change something and then we track responses over time um, rather than just asking somebody what they eat and then 
you know, assuming that it's correct and, and, and looking at the long-term outcomes. And particularly as individuals get older, we know from interventional studies where we have, you know, looked at them and we've fixed the amount of protein that they, that they eat or increased the amount of protein they eat and we look at their outcomes. That as you get older, in order to maintain muscle mass and strength, which and particularly strength, which is a critical component of long-term health, older people need more protein. And in general, as we get older, we tend to eat less protein. We, we tend mm. like often um, hunger decreases and the protein is very satiating. And so the protein intake decreases over time. So not only do we eat less, we also need more relatively. Mm. Um, and so in general, I think particularly as people get older, um, they, they have a relative protein deficiency and that affects a, a whole bunch of things, right? That affects gut function because you have a high turnover of cells in your gut. You need protein to replenish those. Um, it affects uh, muscle function, probably cognitive function. You know, the amino acids are really important uh, for neurotransmitters and all these other things. So in general, I think most people under eat protein. Um, and there have been studies where they give people vast amounts of protein and see almost no negative effects on their health, like four grams per kilo. So it'd be me like eating 400 grams of protein. That's a heroic amount. It's a huge amount of protein. I would never eat that much protein. Heroic. <laughs> <laughs> but in these studies, they were, they're eating that for a year or two. It has no negative effects on on any blood markers or, or, or anything. What, what about these rumors that high protein diets are problematic for our kidneys? Where does that come from? So, so one of the things is that if you if you overeat protein above your requirements, you will your kidneys will have to work harder to excrete the extra nitrogen, which is mm -hmm. which is from that. But that's that's part of what the the kidneys do. That's that's part of their job. Mm -hmm. um, in people who have normal kidney function, so if you have chronic kidney disease and or you know you're on the way to or or need dialysis, it's a completely different question, yeah, right? For sure. Uh, you absolutely speak to your renal team. That's that's the important thing you need to do. But for people with with normal healthy kidneys, eating you know, there's no negative effect of of protein intake or kidney function. I'm not actually entirely sure where that originally remote, came originally from, yeah. came from, but there's there's really no evidence to, to, to support that. I really appreciate that. Whenever I come across conflicting bits of information, or let's say different health experts giving advice on the same topic, but completely different bits of advice, which again, is one of the reasons I wanted to have this conversation, because I think there is a lot of confusion where people go, wait a minute, this expert who I really like and respect said this, this other expert who's also a medical doctor, or also a scientist or a researcher, said the complete opposite. I don't know what to do anymore. Mm -hmm. The way I look at that often is I, I go and trust what I've seen time and time again with patients. Mm -hmm. Right, it's because, as you said before, you can actually find a lot of science to support both sides. Often, yeah. off an argument, which gets really, really confusing. But what I know is that I, I have seen over, you know, I've seen tens of thousands of patients, and I've been applying these lifestyle principles for many, many years. And whilst I would always say there's very rarely one approach that works for everyone, there are some common principles that I've seen work time and time again, one of them being in this modern food environment. I think that also comes into it, right? When and where are we studying people? In the context of a food environment, which is highly problematic and full of ultra-processed foods everywhere we go, encouraging us to eat too much and for too long a period over 24 hours, I found, honestly, that increasing our protein intake for many people really helps them get back on track. Yeah. It helps them feel fuller. It helps them eat less overall. And so I guess my bias would be that I've seen that work over and over again. Yeah. So for me, it's a helpful recommendation. I think most people benefit from a bit more. But then what does that mean? Because you will hear things like, some people say 1.8 grams of protein per kilo. That's more. That's I think that's more than you need. I do because yeah. if I apply that to myself, right? I'm almost six foot seven. I weigh. I don't know. I, I really don't weigh myself, but I'm probably somewhere between ninety five and one hundred kilos. So let's call it one hundred kilos for simple maths. That's like one hundred eighty grams of protein a day. That, I think that feels pretty heroic as well, <laughs> right? That's that's a lot of protein. Now you may say actually for your height and frame that's fine, but you know. And I never really like even getting into, you know, 
grams per kilo. But yeah. I do I do accept for some people it's helpful. Do you have a recommendation about that? So I think the the general recommendation, and there's been um you know lots of different meta-analyses and these other things that 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 look at, you know, how well do you respond in terms of and again, like muscle mass and strength, I think those are a nice hard outcome that we know are associated with with long-term health outcomes at the same time not seeing any negative effects. And in general, it pro- is probably somewhere around 1.2 to 1.5 grams per kilo, say. Uh, there was a meta-analysis that looked at strength responses in uh, younger and older individuals and the the optimal amount of protein intake from, again, interventional studies seems to be about 1.5. But there have been other studies that compared like 1.3 to 1.7 and they see sim- they see similar responses. So it's somewhere in that, in that kind of range. Um, and in, in general, what that means is that if you have three or four meals a day or, you know, three or more periods of where you intake some calories, that each of those contains something like 20 to or 30 to 40 grams of grams of protein. And you can figure out what that looks like in terms of a cut of steak or salmon or, or eggs or, or tofu or, or yogurt. Um, you know, there's some strained Greek yogurts that have a a high protein content and that that and i think that's how you should in the way that i would work with people is that's that's the basis of the meal like that comes first and then things come around because that's the most probably going to be the most critical single component that you want to consistently make sure you're you're consuming because the the fats and the carbs and things they can kind of go up and down and around but i think the, the protein i would recommend be relatively consistent and in that range and Relative to what you mentioned earlier, as I say, there was another study uh, by Kevin Hall that I mentioned earlier where they had people consume uh, either an ultra-processed versus a, a minimally processed diet. And they they have them in the lab and they they can eat as much as they want and they you know they measure all, uh, everything that they eat and they can follow them you know, for several weeks at a time. And even though they matched for like fiber and these other things in the diets those who are eating ultra processed foods so and it was if you look at it it's just like tip it's just like uh cereal uh sandwiches bread right just typical that's those the standard are, stand, diet for stand, many people standard diet um those individuals on that diet ate about 500 calories more on yeah. average per day four to 500 calories more per day and but the protein was consistent in the two diets. So the idea is, it comes to this idea of something called the protein leverage hypothesis, yeah. which is that you continue eating until you reach a certain protein threshold that your body needs. And so most, like I said, ultra processed foods are low in protein. And part of what's driving you to eat more of them is to get up to some protein requirement. So an easy way to get around that is to make protein the focus of a meal, and then you will be more satiated and you're less likely to overeat in response. There are some proponents, uh, I think, of having a minimum of 30 grams of protein, particularly after, let's say, an overnight fast. I think someone like Gabrielle Lyon, for example, or Don Lehman would promote a minimum of 30 grams to make sure you're getting the minimum requirement of leucine that's needed to to build muscle. You mentioned before, I think, 20 to 40 grams. And the 20 being... There are some people who are a lot smaller than you or I, so twenty would be just fine. So that's that's where Got that it. range starts to come into play. Fine. So yeah. twenty to forty grams, yeah. basically, you're saying should be the mainstay of most people's meals, and that will depend whether you're slight or whether you know if you're very tall and large. Well, if you're very tall like me, <laughs> uh, it's probably going to be more towards forty grams. Yes. Okay. So helpful. And I also love what you said before that there really isn't that much evidence that high protein diets, if you have too much, you're not really causing harm. No. Your kidneys will just have to get rid of it. Yeah, Fine. Well, let's just talk about exercise and movement. I think there is a lot of confusion about exercise. What's the state of play? Okay. We have a sedentary <laughs> population, right? Who are not moving enough. There's a lot of talk these days about different types of exercise, different zones of exercise. There's talk of HIIT training, high intensity training, walking. And then, you know, I talk about it as different gears of movement. So gear one might be walking around the block. Gear two, very much equating to your car, you're going a little bit faster perhaps. And there's a lot of talk about the unique benefits of 
what is being called zone two training. And some of the advice around that, I think is going to be very unachievable for many mm. people. So let's try and break it down. What's your current perspective on movement and what we all should be doing? I think I said something like this last time and I still feel exa- I still feel the same, which is that whatever you can do that's more than what you're currently doing is great. Um, until you get to the very, and then that I, I remember some comments of people going in like, oh no, people shouldn't lift weights because they're going to get injured. Well, actually lifting weights in, a, in a, like a bodybuilding style is one of the safest forms of exercise you can do in terms of injury risk. And then some people said, oh yes, but you can get to a point where you're doing so much exercise that it's detrimental. And yes, of course that's the case, but like, I'm, I'm not worried about, I'm not talking about people exercising 30 hours a week, right? I'm talking about somebody going for a walk for 20 minutes a day. Um, and so, th- so whatever you can do sustainably above what you're currently doing or previously have done will benefit your health. And I think, you know, that could be steps per day. Uh, it could be, you know, amount of time, amount of time you spend going for a jog or cycling or, or lifting weights or any kind of resistance training or anything like that. So, um, if you look at, say, the the amount of physical activity that significantly improves certain health outcomes. So, you know, me, I often think about the brain. Um, so the amount of physical activity that significantly improves cognitive function, been large meta-analyses have looked at this, is basically, it doesn't um, matter exactly what type you do, but if you're achieving, say, government physical activity or guidelines, which is 150 minutes per week of moderate to vigorous physical activity, that is associated with a statistically significant improvement in cognitive function. And you can break that up however you like. You could do uh, 30 minutes of brisk walking a day. You could do 20 minutes of Pilates a day. You could do 30 minutes of resistance training a day. You could do five minutes of sprinting per day. The way that it works in general at the simplest level is intensity times time. So the more intense, the less time you need. The less intense, the the more time you need. So you can, like one day you can go do a little bit of sprinting in the park if you want, or you can go for a brisk walk, or you could do an hour of gardening, right? That's even less intense, but even that's going to have some benefits. So incrementally improving this sort of intensity times time, this volume that you're doing in any of those activities is going to be beneficial. And like that, that's honestly where I start. And if you want to then dig into resistance training versus endurance training and those other things we can do that but the most important thing is that you do some movement every day and if you're sedentary right now literally anything that you can get up and do is is going to be beneficial okay that's really useful and really empowering i think for people what you said about intensity there is really really interesting so by what measurement or through what lens are you saying that one hour's gardening might be equivalent to five minutes of sprinting because we could probably measure that in a multitude of different ways Mm. or look at various aspects of that to try and compare them. How are you comparing them when you say that they're the same? So in general, when that's done, they use something called the metabolic equivalent or MET. And you can can Google, uh, there's, there's a PDF of METs for different activities and it's very long like literally um every intensity of pretty much any activity you could think of it it gives you an average met and of course that's if i go sprinting it's a very different number of mets than if you go sprinting but it just gives you an idea of the overall intensity of that activity and so then if i think about the cognitive function study what they looked at was how many met minutes per week so again that's intensity times time would you need to do per week to see a significant improvement in cognitive function? And it was about 700, which then, you know, with a little bit of back of the back of the envelope calculation is about the physical activity, mm. general government physical activity guidelines. So that's how, and when you look at that, that kind of says that, you know, overall, those, those are going to have equivalent benefits. And when, then when you look at, say, harder outcomes like VO2 max, which is a, a measure of how efficient your cardiovascular system is, that's sort of the gold standard, then yes, there's probably some protocols that improve VO2 max a little bit better than others. But if you look across all the studies that have been done, in general, you see the same trend, that it's intensity times time. So if you do very intense uh, work for a short period of time, that has a similar benefit to 
a less intense uh, a, a period of exercise for, for a longer period of time. And again, this is, you know, if we're just thinking about normal people <laughs> trying to move and improve their health, I think that's really the, the 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 main important principle that it would boil down to. Could, could we take that to an extreme? Let's say there's someone listening who, for whatever reason, doesn't move much at mm. all. They get to work, do their desk job all day, come home and uh, sat down at home and struggles with motivation to move their bodies or time or whatever it might be. If they every day did five minutes of sprinting as hard as they could, let's say, let's say a few intervals, maybe, I don't know, 20 seconds of sprinting, 40 seconds recovery walking, 20 seconds of sprinting, right? and they do that for five minutes. So that's a pretty intense workout. Yeah. Whereas someone else says, you know what, I'm going to go for an hour's walk every day, a nice gentle walk every day. And I know there's other benefits, nature, stress reduction, time away from your work. It gets really complex if we're trying to look at all those different things. But from a pure movement perspective on the body, are we saying through one lens, they're pretty similar? Essentially, yes. Um assuming that you find some way to match the total amount of work that those two people mm. are doing, which you can through like a intensity times time lens. Mm. In general, I think they're both going to improve their health and it's going to be really difficult to separate out mm. one versus the other. Yeah. It's really, really interesting and empowering for people. So that's a sedentary population, right? Where you're going, okay, anything is better than nothing. And yeah. you're going to get a huge improvement if you go from nothing to something. What about for people who, I guess, have a bit more time or are already active? Let's say they're already able to go for a 30-minute walk seven days a week. They're like, Tommy, look, I, I can do that. That's no problem. I my life and my work allows me to do that. What else should I be doing as I get older to, you know, look after my health, body, brain, mind, everything? Where would you go next? Resistance training of some kind there's some kind of weightlifting or something where you're applying resistance to, to the muscles. I, you know, there's lots of different ways that you can think about this. Uh, in general, um, I think there's a, I have a pyramid, a movement pyramid. It's my own movement pyramid. And, and I think at the, at the bottom is just spending less time sitting. Right. So there's even, there's even benefits to, um, you're getting a standing desk if you, if you can. Also, say say you're a, you're in a job where you're sitting all day. Is there some way to make it so that you're just sitting less? And that could even be this idea of movement snacks, where you know once an hour you go for a quick walk or you go up mm. and down some stairs or w whatever you can do near you. So just less time sitting. Um, and then the next would be spend more time walking. Mm -hmm. And there's a whole bunch of studies again suggesting that brisk walking. Um, particularly in those who are who are otherwise sedentary, can dramatically improve um, your health. And there's this linear benefit of number of steps you can get per day in terms of mortality risk and, and various disease risk up to maybe somewhere between eight and 14,000 steps per day or something. But the more you can do in that zero to 10 or 12,000, the better, really. And a lot of that, if, particularly if you're doing quite brisk walking, so say you're doing your 30 minutes and it's quite brisk, um, then that for many people, maybe getting them up into that area that you mentioned, briefly mentioned earlier, that zone two. So you're getting some of those cardiovascular benefits. And that's probably where a lot of that benefit comes from. So then the next level, I think, is is resistance training. Um, and particularly as you get older, we know there's a decrease in muscle mass, but more importantly, and probably faster and earlier, there's a decrease in strength. And as you get older, you lose, in particular, type 2 muscle fibers. These are fast-switch muscle fibers. And those are important for a number of reasons because they're, they're an important glucose sink. So they're important for metabolic health, right? So if you're talk we talked earlier about all these things that affect your blood sugar, mm. having healthy, active muscles and having a lot of these types of fibers is really mm. important for our blood sugar control and a whole host of other things. Um, and it's also really important for our stability and mobility and function. So... If you lose those fast twitch fibers, those are the ones that are important for like reactions. And like if you uh, if you are like are going to fall, like grabbing onto a handrail or stopping mm. yourself from falling. And you know, particularly as you get older, you know, falls risks and uh, broken hips and all that kind of stuff. You're going to be protected against that if you have more of those types of muscle fibers. And those are the ones that you get through resistance training. The ones you develop in, in particular. 
you know, it, it affects all the all of your muscle tissue, but those are the ones that you protect when you do that kind of resistance training. I wonder if we could just spend a bit of time trying to define resistance training. Uh, and the reason I'm asking this question is some people don't want to go to the gym. Mm. And you know, given that gyms are a relatively modern phenomenon mm -hmm. and that humans have lived to pretty decent ages for a long period of time, I think when we say resistance training or strength training, we have to broaden it out beyond lifting weights in a gym. Because yeah. for the people who love that, they love hearing it and go, yeah, I knew I was on it with strength <laughs> training, right? But for people who don't like it, it can be a bit confusing. So indoor climbing, running up hills, right? Yeah. You know, that's resistance against gravity. In your view, what counts as resistance training? So it, it can be, it's, it's literally any movement where you're, you know, you're moving your body in space against, so against something that makes it harder than it normally would be for that movement, if that makes sense, right? So, so, so carrying your shopping bags to your car or even to your home or... Is that resistance training? Because yeah, instead of walking, you're, you're carrying, right? Yeah, and we've talked previously about, so you mentioned the blue zones, and in the Nicoyan Peninsula, they're not all down the gym all day, right? Um, but they are doing physical activity every day that includes things like carrying and lifting. Um, and so, and you can translate that to your own activities of daily living, as we call it, right? So if you want to be able to carry your shopping, um, then heavy shopping bags are resistance training. Um, and any time that you're moving your body, and so it could be squats just with your body weight, that's resistance training. Or you, you could do push-ups and it can be against the wall rather than against the floor. You know, that, that's resistance training. Um, and, and it can just be these daily activities like lifting things into cupboards and carrying things around. Like all of that counts. And particularly as you get older, you want to maintain those, you want to maintain mm. those functions. So anywhere you can find an opportunity to move your body against some kind of resistance, that counts. The the problem, you know, does become at some point you need to progress things. Mm -hmm. So in order for it to create, again, anything is better than nothing. But to create an ongoing stimulus, it has to be a I think it has to be a little bit challenging. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're just going to... So, so maybe uh, you do a few uh, car phrases, squats, push-ups against the wall, a few bicep curls in the kitchen, like all of that stuff is great. Um, but at some point you have to make sure that you're, you, you would like to progress. It would like to be... You would like to get stronger such that that is no longer enough. And then you have to find some way to make it a little bit harder. So the, I think there has to be a challenge component to it. So as the well. push up against the wall then has to be the push up against the table. Yeah. And then the push up against the chair. And yeah. then a few months later, maybe push up on the actual floor. Yeah, exactly. Um, and also, I think I just want to highlight, let's say, yoga and Pilates, for example, oh, yeah. because sometimes I feel that gets left out of strength training. And I think uh, participants uh, and teachers of those disciplines will often say, hold on. A lot of what we do is is hard on the muscles, you yeah. know. And there are plenty of yoga moves, for example, or Pilates moves, which I think do count as resistance oh, yeah. training. I think they absolutely should be included, particularly for 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 this kind of discussion. Um, that I mean, there's a lot of yoga stuff. You know, I'm relatively strong. There's a lot of yoga poses and things that I can't I can't do. It's a different. It's different. It's different, but it definitely counts as 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 resistance. Absolutely. Is there a next rung on your pyramid? Yes. Yeah, so then the the next rung um, is high is sort of high is high intensity interval training or hit. And the reason why it's next is because I think that and again this is for um, this is not for elite sports performance. This is just for average people who want to try and figure out how to uh, separate out their time in terms of movement. And so you will get some cardiovascular benefit from your brisk walking and it, or it could be it could be cycling or, or, or something right yeah. it doesn't it doesn't have to be walking but I, I like walking because anybody or most people can do it um but then you do get some slightly you know if, if you then want to get into the physiological biochemical nitty-gritty you do get different adaptations to high intensity training versus lower intensity training right i think in general that idea of intensity times time is what's most important but of course different things happen at the cellular level when you do mm -hmm. one versus the other
And so you can, you know, that that's that's a beneficial add-on uh, on top of, say, resistance training if you're already doing some some low-level uh, intensity movement. And then on top of that, um, you know, if you if you really enjoy it, I think you can do very long periods of of endurance training. But it, but but I don't think most people need that if they're just trying to move as much as they as they can or to improve their health. So that's kind of the that's the progression that I use. Yeah, so, so I really like that. Um, if someone's hearing that and, and says, okay, Tommy, look, I don't move much. I like that pyramid, but do I have to sequentially go up it? Or for example, if someone goes, you know what? I used to do some strength training while I was at school, but I haven't done it in ages and I quite fancy that. There's no reason why they can't start there right on your no. pyramid. They don't have to progress up. Yeah, and... Um What's what's quite good about say say if you're going to the gym is there's there's a lot of you start doing the other stuff as well. So when you when you're at the gym, you're usually not like sitting like you would in in, in a chair at a desk or on the couch or on the sofa, and you're probably walking around quite a bit, right? You're, you're getting some of that you know mm. additional movement, and um, there are some some nice papers that talk about how particularly if you do weight training to what they call voluntary muscular failure, right? So you do a number of repetitions mm. to the point where you can't do any more with good form. Even that has some cardiovascular benefits, right? So you're similar to maybe some some lo- low, lower intensity uh, aerobic training. So yeah, I think you know, anywhere in that that's, 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 a, um, that's a good entry point for you, I think is, is great. And that's always where I would want people to start. The reason why I have like very long hard endurance exercise at the top is because that's often where people start because that's where they assume they need to be in order to improve their health right if i'm gonna i need to go for a run i need to be hard i need to do it for an hour or else there's no point in doing it but actually that's that's quite taxing on the body and you don't necessarily get all the the other benefits that you would from those other different types of uh, types of training so that's why i put it at the top but there's other there's, there's lots of other places that people can enter and again anything that you can do that you enjoy and is sustainable that's the place to start and the other thing i i guess i'd want to add there is we forget sometimes that exercise and high intensity exercise can be a stressor yeah. on the body and what i've i've often seen with certain patients is they have very high stress lives go 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 and then the workout is also you know high intensity a fast one hour run that is very hard mm. on the body and i've i think Again, this is a much broader conversation, so we'll have to save this for another time. But I do think we also need to think about how much is this exercise now taxing us? Yeah. And I certainly have found over the last couple of years, I've really been leaning more into a lot of low intensity, you know, walks or bikes or swimming where, you know, it's just nice and relaxed, but I'm going for 30, 40 minutes, maybe an hour. I'm like, wow. I feel like I need no recovery. It doesn't stress me out. And I kind of measure it sometimes with HRV and heart rate variability and things like that. And I'm like, wow, I do feel that we sometimes forget about the stress components. So that's if people really want to dive into it. But but I agree with the message, which is anything's better than nothing. And it's probably not that much for most people, right? That's going to give them some benefits. Yeah. uh, The main thing that I try and get across is that the dose needed or the amount you do needed to, to see some benefit again for, for most people is really quite low. And that, the, cause, cause often what you see, and that's, that's kind of what I alluded to earlier is that people assume that they need some vast amount, several hours a week in order to see benefit. And if, and if they can't do that, then they just don't bother doing anything. So the, the most important thing is to do more than you're currently doing. Again, if you're relatively sedentary or you're, you know, trying to improve your health through physical activity. Um, and then, you know, once, once you get beyond that point, you have several hours a week to train. Of course, there's lots of different protocols and different things that you can follow. But up until that point, you know, anything that you can do and is sustainable and you enjoy is going to be great. You've touched on muscle mass uh, through the lens of resistance training and how important that is. As we get older, we have spoken about it before. One thing I wanted to cover though is look, if I look at you, you're a muscly guy. You know, you'd like to, you know, you you compete, I think, don't you? In, yeah, in strongman. In strongman, right? So that's a passion for you. And mm. you 
you you eat a certain way, you work out a certain way, so you can compete in this sport. One thing I've been thinking a lot about over the last few months is what's the cost of muscle? Because I don't feel that we see often in these longevity hotspots really muscly people, right? I haven't mm. gone out there and studied this in depth, so yeah. I, you know, I, I can't say I know that for everyone. Or, you know, we often don't hear about them being really muscly in their 40s and 50s. And I often think about a place that I spent a lot of time in, which is Chamonix in France, where it's in the mountains, in the French Alps, and m- many people there, if not most people, are active. Mm. They are, but very functionally active. So a lot of the time you'll see that people have got uh, quite lean, um, they're, 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 they're strong physiques, but not necessarily bodybuilding strong. Yeah. Uh, you see this with mountain guys. And, and I think a lot about, okay, there's a big movement now to say, guys, you've got to work on your muscle mass as you get older mm. because you're going to lose muscle mass as you get older. And it's very important for longevity. It's important for brain health, as you've, you've covered uh, before on the podcast. But we're not necessarily talking about big muscles, I don't think. I'd love you to expand on that. And also, you know, I guess broad, broadly, you know, what is the cost of muscle mass? Because the more muscle you have, I guess the more protein and calories you need to feed that muscle. So how do, how do you think about that? There's, there's several moving parts that, that I'll, try and, I'll try and cover. The first is, is an important one, um, which you didn't ask about, but I will mention, which is that whenever I talk about muscle, everybody's like, well, I don't want to look like you. I don't want to eat like you. I don't want to train like you. And that is not what I'm saying. Absolutely not. Um, and when I say that p- the people should build muscle mass and strength, I'm absolutely not talking about what I do or other, you know, other people do in terms of bodybuilding or, or strength training. Um, that's completely separate. I don't think that that's detrimental to health and we'll cover that as well, but that's not what I'm recommending to people. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it's funny because I actually you mentioned Gabrielle Lyon and um, I heard uh, like a, an anecdote, which is that somebody, uh, somebody was telling me that they've been telling their or suggesting to their wife that they should um, may- maybe do some strength training, you know, for all the reasons that we talked about. And it was sort of like in one ear and out the other. Um, but as soon as she heard another woman like her talk about the importance of strength training, immediately that, mm. that, that, that message went in. So it's, so the message is important, but the messenger is important as well. So 100%. sometimes it's not good for me to talk about muscle because people are like, well, I don't want, you know, that I, I don't want to look like that. And that's, ob- that's definitely not what I'm suggesting. Um, when you look at, again, so at the population level, we're going to use that word again. So we do these large, large studies of people who sort of represent the population and they've done it in the UK with the UK Biobank. They do it with, in the, in the U S with NHANES and other, I mentioned earlier how terrible the NHANES dietary data is. The other data they collect in NHANES is actually very good. Um, and what you see is that those who are in the top 50% of muscle mass, so you know, just above average, they tend to live longer um, and have a, you know, an overall lower risk of most diseases and, and mortality. But there's not like a dose response. It's not like more is better. Mm-hmm. It's just don't... So, so really the... The, what you see from those studies is that low muscle mass being, and you know, we might use the phrase sarcopenia, that's the technical term for just having low muscle mass. Mm. Um, dynopenia is related to low strength um, or loss of strength. So low muscle mass is, is problematic um, rather than more muscle being better, if that makes mm. sense. So you really just don't want to have not very much muscle. Like that's where the real um, signal of benefit comes from, again, at the population level. When you know, studies that I've done either, and there's one we published just recently and there's some other stuff that we're working on. Um, what we've found is that more muscle is not better um, above a, you know, above that low level. But if you do have more muscle, it needs to be functional. So you need to have strength proportional to that amount of muscle mass. Um, and that's the kind of muscle mass that you generate through resistance training. So, If I have more muscle, but I'm stronger with it, I think that that is just fine, right? That, but there's another scenario where you can gain a lot of muscle, and that's this is muscle measured on a on a like a DEXA scan, which is a type of X-ray scan. You look at how much muscle people have, and 
when they do that at the population level, those who have the most muscle, particularly in men, there was a, a, a study that came out um, from the UK Biobank recently. Those who had the, the men who had the most muscle, the top, uh, it was either 20 or 25%, they had a higher risk of mortality and a higher risk of cardiovascular disease. But the men who were the strongest had the lowest risk. So there's this dissociation, that's another fancy word, like the separation of like strength and muscle. Mm. So strength is what's important relative to muscle mass. And when I've looked at some of these data myself, those, you know, muscle does not correlate with physical activity. So these people are not gaining muscle because they get, they're in the gym all the time. They're gaining muscle because they're eating beyond their caloric needs and gaining more total mass. And some and and with that, they they tend to have worse metabolic health, um, more you know uh, high blood pressure, worse blood sugar. Um, so they they're not. It's not muscle that's gained through lifting weights, right? It's muscle gained just through gaining more mass, and some of that is muscle tissue. So as people put on excess weight, there's an assumption that will always be fat. No, some of it is muscle. So you still put on extra muscle yeah. as well. Wow. Yeah. And actually that relationship between strength and muscle reminds me of a conversation I used to have with a really good mate of mine who I was at uni with, who was a, um, a very keen indoor climber. And he used to talk about the perfect, you know, they'd measured the perfect ratio between strength and muscle for climbers because yeah. you don't want too much because then you're too heavy. Yeah, particularly right. in the legs. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And I was like, so it reminds me of those conversations. Yeah. And I, I think the... So there are there are two parts to this. One is that there are there are these studies, and you talked about the cost of muscle. There are these studies that suggest that more muscle is is detrimental, but that's because muscle you know muscle is coming along for the ride with um, you know gaining excess weight and worse metabolic health and all that stuff that comes with it. That muscle has not been gained with a proportional improvement in strength or function. But if you look at having a high level of strength or function relative to your muscle mass. That's incredibly predicted of cognitive function and, and mortality risk. So you want enough muscle. You just don't, you don't want to have very little, and you want that muscle to be strong and functional. That's the most important thing, and that's that's what you're talking about in terms of those those individuals that you see um, in the French Alps, and in, in terms of the the individuals you see in in longevity centers, or you know you know places around the world where people live a long time. It's functional. It's functional. Um, so whatever muscle that you have has to be functional. I think that's the main that's the main takeaway. To make sure you're taking action after watching this video, I've created a free guide to help you build healthy habits. We can all make short-term change, but can those changes become a fundamental part of our life? Often they don't. And that's why in this free guide, I share with you the six crucial steps you need to take. They're really, really effective. If you want to get hold of that free guide right now, all you have to do is click the link in the description box below. Now, related to that, Tommy, again, when, whenever we talk about anything, we have to think about in what population are we talking about it for? Hmm. And sometimes when I think about some of the protein research and the encouragement to high protein diets, I know we've covered that there's no real detrimental effects and you, you believe in, as I do, that many people are under-eating protein. And we think about it in terms of our muscle mass. Like if you're not eating enough protein, let's say you let's say you should be eating 30 grams for your for your size at a meal. Now let's say you get really, really active and do loads of strength training. If you do that, yes, I know you need protein to support the muscle growth. But is there a case to say, and I, I kind of think that maybe this happens in some longevity hotspots, that they are really, really active, maybe not eating high protein, but because they're so active and they're so functionally active, they're still maintaining muscle. Yeah, when you... I think the, the best way to understand it in terms of the, say the research that we have is if you have individuals who are um, calorie-restricted, um, and when you restrict calories, one of the things, right, you lose weight and that comes from fat and muscle and, you know, other tissue as well. But in that scenario, if you add in physical activity, you preferentially keep that muscle tissue mm -hmm. and you're, you'll preferentially get your, your energy elsewhere. So even if, you know, you have a, 
uh, a period of time where you're e- either dramatically under eating or you have a, a high energy expenditure, um, then you will preferentially keep your muscle mass and strength as long as you maintain activity levels. So that becomes important if people decide to do long periods of fasting. Maintaining activity is important so that you preferentially keep, you don't use your muscle tissue for energy. Um, and so that's that's partly what a mm. part of what comes in there. But I think there's there's also been a big debate in terms of so again we go back go back to the the blue the blue zones. There's there's been some some pretty reasoned debate in terms of how much protein those those um, groups are actually eating, and it is it is probably more than the typical uh, Western diet. You know, they're they're not eating low protein diets, uh, mm. but then they're also physically active, and all these other things are important as well. I do remember. Um a conversation a few years ago, I was I was speaking at a longevity conference and Michel Poulin was there, who was one of the original researchers who went to study in the mm. Blue Zones. And he shared with me that he, essentially that in some Blue Zones, they're eating more animal products yeah. than maybe... Than we've been led to believe. Yeah. I love a lot of the stuff on Blue Zones for sure. I think they're really, really interesting. But... What their diet is, I, I, I'm not sure we're fully sure yet. Yeah. Or certainly I've heard conflicting things, let's yeah. put it like that. Yeah. And when you step outside of those um, you know, small pockets and you look at you know, more, say, uh, higher income or, you know, you know, westernized, for want of a better word, societies, there are lots of populations around the world that eat a very high protein intake relatively and have some of the the, the longest lived people on average, so like Hong Kong and mm. Iceland, eat a lot of animal products, a lot of meat, a lot of protein, and they are some of the longest lived nations on earth. Um, so, so I think that using, you know, the blue zones are informative, but if you try and look at an overall population that's closer to, to ours in terms of overall technological, you know, development or, you know, an access to foods, then those I think are worth considering as well. Um, and in general, you know, they there are there are several that that have a high protein diet and and you know, live a long time. Yeah, and I think also the nature of science often is to be reductive, so we can measure one thing. Yeah, but our human experience isn't that reductive, right? We have all different kinds of inputs into our lives, and so I often feel that. It, it gets hard because, you know, science is very useful to inform us. But then, and, and I'm, I guess I'm biased from my experiences with patients where I kind of feel, yeah, that's one factor, but it kind of depends what are the other factors that are going on as well. Yeah. That influences how much that factor is important. Yeah. So thinking about food intake without also thinking about physical activity and stress and sleep, Yes, can be useful, but potentially limited as well. So I, I feel I, <laughs> I feel like we over focus on diet most of the time. So like, that's that's where everybody wants to go. When all the other things that you mentioned, probably for the vast majority of people, are going to be at least, if not more, important. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, you covered quite a lot, Tommy. I mean, maybe just one more topic: <laughs> um, supplements. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're a fan of creatine, aren't you? Yeah. Why? <laughs> Um, because it does everything. No, it's it's probably the one supplement that I would routinely recommend to pretty much everybody. Um, there was a there was a recent study that came out in uh, postmenopausal women where they took creatine um, for two years, and it it was associated with some improvements in in uh, bone strength you know obviously that's uh, uh, that's 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 important for for postmenopausal women um i i'm a i'm a big fan of it because of its effect on the brain so um there are several studies showing that creatine supplementation acutely improves cognitive performance uh, that's in like in athletes and young healthy people and there have been large meta analyses looking at creatine supplementation on cognitive function and uh, the benefits are greater as you get older so in those who are older um, they they have they seem to have a great they have a greater benefit. Um, there are studies where they've used creatine as an add-on to uh, antidepressant therapy in those with major depressive disorder and seen a significant improvement above uh, what what they got in terms of the response from from the antidepressant. 
And there are some some studies suggesting that uh, you know the population level epidemiology, the amount of creatine that people get from their diets is associated with their um, with their mood or risk of um, mood disorders. Um, then there's the effect on strength that you know that in the majority of people, uh, creatine intake is associated with Im- improved strength and and, and muscle function. Um, so a wide variety of um, uh, systems and organs in the body seem to benefit from from adequate uh, creatine intake, and not um, it, the 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 amount that you would take is is maybe around something like five to ten grams per day, and that's not um, that's not a heroic dose. We'll go back to that term uh, relative to what you could get from the diet. So a, a tin of sardines um, is somewhere around three to five grams of creatine. So. Uh, and uh, five grams of creatine is probably, you know, it's like a kilo or two of salmon or or beef. And like, a, not a lot of people eat that much salmon or beef, but it's it's possible to to eat that much from the diet. But just most people don't. Um, what is it? So it's uh um it's 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 made out of three amino acids, and it's essentially well, it does it does a number of things, but it, its main uh, role is as uh, an energy buffer. So earlier we talked about ATP, adenosine triphosphate. And when you move energy around the cell and you use it to do different functions with with proteins and things like that, um, you do this in, with what we call high energy phosphates. So you break this bond with, with this phosphate molecule, and then that provides the energy mm. for the process. When you um, take ATP and you use up a phosphate, you create energy, uh, ADP, adenosine diphosphate. So it's gone from tri, which means three, to di, which means two. And then that needs to be recycled. And that's essentially what your mitochondria do. They're, they're recycling mm. ATP or generating ATP. Uh, creatine creates a buffer for that system. So creatine, you put a a phosphate onto it, it's called phosphocreatine, and it's used to recycle uh, ATP. Um, So it's kind of like this short-term energy buffer. Um, And that's why it improves um, physical performance. But some of the things that it improves in terms of cognitive performance, we're probably less sure about. Uh, It seems to have some effect on uh, mitochondrial function and, and some other things. Um, it uh, it integrates with the methylation system because uh, producing creatine, and we make our own, um, is one of the most methylation intensive processes in the body. The, you know, by some accounts, the majority of methylation is used in order to generate and regenerate creatine in the body. So, you know, and then when you do that, you you if you supplement with it, so you don't need to make it yourself, then you're offsetting the need for b vitamins and mm. all these other these other uh, nutrient requirements wow. you know, as part of the system so there's a number of different ways that it and to be honest we don't really know all of them we <laughs> we know it has these beneficial effects that we've tested in randomized controlled trials but the exact mechanism by which that happens is still kind of up for debate quite cheap and accessible for people is it uh very cheap um you you know if people are gonna are gonna buy it they should buy something called uh, creatine monohydrate that's the that's the cheap form that's been um, well studied uh, in all kinds of populations for decades and decades. It's very safe. Um, most of it is made uh, in Germany. Uh, it's a product called Crea Pure, and then they do what they call white labeling. So uh, a sports supplement company mm-hmm. just like buy, it buys it in bulk and then puts their own label on it. And it's the same thing. And so just like a, a scoop of one of those, and it can also be. Um, useful if you're going to buy supplements. In general, there's some due diligence that I would or- always recommend that people do. So um, there are third-party testing companies or, or groups that test for impurities, and that can be important if you're a, a drug-tested athlete, but also for other things that you don't necessarily want to be in your supplements. So things like informed sport, you can see that as a stamp uh, on your supplements. Um, and then often companies will say that they're batch tested or third party tested. That means that they're making sure they're not full of heavy metals and these other things. Mm. Um, because, you know, some supplements, you know, particularly cheaper ones, or you don't know where they, where they came from, they're made in some anonymous factory somewhere and who knows what's in them and, you know, wouldn't recommend that people take those. So 
you can you can often ask for certificates of analysis, so you know yeah. where people have tested for impurities and stuff like that. And I, I think that if people are going to take supplements, it's worth doing that little bit of due diligence. But in general, if you see Informed Sport or something else, and like you can go to Holland and Barrett and you can buy an Informed Sport certified creatine monohydrate, uh, it's very cheap. You know, anybody can do that. You don't need to spend a whole bunch of time doing research on it. And I think that brings up a, a wider point on supplements. And I think one of the reasons why the medical profession for many years has been quite anti-supplements is because of the lack of regulation. Yeah. So there are poor quality supplements yeah. out there for sure, but there are also high quality uh -huh. ones. Yeah. And I kind of feel the whole thing, supplements, good or bad, is a is a ridiculous question in and of itself. It's like a pharmaceutical drug is good or bad. Well, kind of depends yeah. for who yeah. in what dose. Yeah. Uh, for how long for. And I personally have seen the right supplements be very beneficial for patients over a number of years. Um, so I have a slight, I don't really share that view that's been there in medicine for a number of years, which is, you know, we, you know, stay away from supplements because we routinely give them like B12 is a supplement yeah. or vitamin D is a yeah. supplement. And we, you know, so I, I don't kind of, yeah, that, but there's a bit of nuance there. And as you say, if you're going to get one, get a high quality one. Yeah. And in terms of other other supplements, in general, um, the the vitamins like come very, like in those who need them, come very high on a list of things that I would recommend. So um, vitamin D, uh, very important. Some of the B vitamins, very important. So um, I think we measured, uh, talked previously about measuring something like a homocysteine, mm -hmm. if you can, particularly if you're thinking about uh, both brain health, but then also cardiovascular health. And B vitamins that are relevant for that are RB12, folate, B6, uh, B2, which is riboflavin. And you can you can get these from a, right, if you're eating uh, some green leafy vegetables and um, some eggs and meat, you'll get a lot of those. Mm -hmm. um, but equally, we know that being deficient in those is associated with a whole host of chronic health conditions. So, you know, I I think we should, you know, at the in terms of within the NHS, we should probably be doing a little bit more testing for those things so that they can be they can be supplemented if yeah. If homocysteine, I still think, isn't routinely available no. in the NHS. It's still a serum B twelve, and um, you know, this whole thing about promoting diet and lifestyle first. Yes, of course, but we also acknowledge in this conversation how tricky it can be for people to eat well. Yeah, and that's why. Yeah, I'm all for a food first approach, but at the same time, I recognize that many stroke, most people are finding it hard to yeah. get the nutrition they need. There's, I don't know if you've seen this research on soil quality and how that's poorer now. And so are we getting the same level of nutrients that we were getting 50 years ago yeah. from the same foods? That's really interesting. Also, I've tested um, B12 a number of ways over a period of years. And I've been really quite surprised by how many people have suboptimal B12 levels, yeah. even animal food eaters. And I think a lot of that may also come down to the chronic stress in society because we need good stomach acid to absorb B12 if it's going through our gut and into our stomach. And one of the things that chronic stress will do is alter levels of stomach acid, alter how your digestive function is. And so I'm thinking, well, I think more people than we currently think, I think would probably benefit from... Yeah improving their B vitamins. Um, for B12 also, like if you're taking a proton pump inhibitor for reflux, or if you're taking metformin for type 2 diabetes, like both of those can also, particularly for B12 precipitate, um, uh, B12 deficiency. So there's a lot of other things that we're doing where we're ma managing these other health conditions where we could then be making a, a, a B12 deficiency or insufficiency worse. So so that that's a critical one. But then all the B vitamins, um, I, th you know, I think we we've become focused on B12 and folate, but All these other ones become important as well, yeah. And I will say that if you are low, the amount of patients I've seen who've had vague symptoms, really low energy, and then, you know, in one patient, I remember in particular, check the homocysteine, it was through the roof, you correct it, they just feel like a different person. Yeah. And they can go for years not getting properly treated and having a substandard quality of life. And... So yeah, a lot more we could talk about. <laughs> hey, Tommy, I think we've covered, I think we've done pretty well. Uh -huh. You've done great on a, on a whole host <laughs> of different topics. Anything on those topics that you feel you didn't say that you want to get out there? No, I, I, I don't think so. I, I mean, for each of them, you could, you could spend an hour and do a lot, of, a lot more homework um, to, 
to really delve into all the nuances. But the important thing I think to remember is that none of these things are good or bad and context is always important. And, you know, just understanding how these things might be important uh, for you. But then, but then hopefully also when people have gotten conflicting messages, we've, we've, kind of help them navigate maybe where they need to enter into something or, or whether something is worthwhile for them. Yeah. Well, Tommy, I really enjoyed that. I really hope the audience like what was a very different format to these normal conversations. And if they do, we can perhaps do another one and cover another eight to 10 topics. But thanks for coming back on the show. I appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. This is a lot of fun. If that conversation resonated with you, here is another incredibly powerful one that I really think you're going to enjoy. If at 37, your limit is just being able to run that 30 minute park run, at 75, you're gonna have a very difficult time getting around.